Um, so we're going to start with the roll call. And I know this evening, Ms. Lohman, Mr. Fishbein, and Mr. Schultz will not be able to join us. So I'll start with who I see on the screen, Ms. Mulhern. Here. Mr. Cohen. Present. Mr. Epps. Present. And I don't see Mr. Burdell Williams. Okay. And Miss Pamela Henry, she was just jumping off of another call, so um, she'll probably be on shortly. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of May the 18th, 2022? Do, do we need to wait until Pam is here so we have five of us to do that? Four. Yes, we do. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> and we can, yes, thank you for that. We can come back to that um, action item uh, so, as we, so that we don't hold up the actual presentation. And this evening, we have just one thing on the agenda, one topic on the agenda, and it's our end of the year final review of our strategic plan. Um, everyone's aware that our strategic plan was from 2016 through 2021. However, um, due to the pandemic, we decided, and, and other issues, we decided to extend the strategic plan for one more year um, as we develop a new plan um, this coming year. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Smith. Good evening, everyone. And Dr. Riley is going to do the honors of advancing this evening's slides. So I'll give him a moment to get set up. Okay, thank you. You want me to share it now? I think okay. I have it ready to go. Yep, we're ready. Thank you. Maybe I'm not ready. Hang on. There should be. Try this a different way. Okay, you should be able to see that now. Yes, we can. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Sure. Okay, so as um sorry about that. So as Ms. Uh Hayward uh announced tonight's presentation is our final wrap-up of our 2000. 21 ending strategic plan. Um, as you know, our calendar year and our um, school year do not exactly align. So we do have some items that we did finish up this particular school year because it is the 21-22 school year. And so we are going to just take a few moments to wrap up this current strategic plan. And we're going to end with a few recommendations of um, what we believe should happen going into the next plan. We are going to review um, our final uh, evidence pieces on the five pathways. And we just ask that we hold questions until the end of the presentation. And um, next slide, please. So um, just really quickly, as if people don't know, we've been doing this for quite some time. This is the overview of the strategic plan, our five pathways, curriculum and instruction, pathway two, student achievement, pathway three, professional learning, pathway four, holistic experiences, and rounding out at the end, pathway five, communications and engagement. And on this screen, you also see the big goals whereby 2021, um, there were some things that we wanted to make sure that we accomplished in each area. Next slide, please. And for the pathway one of curriculum and instruction, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Riley. He is going to walk you through where we landed, where we finished, where we wrapped up with pathway one, curriculum and instruction. Dr. Riley. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith, and good evening, everybody. So pathway one, and I know we can all see this, uh, but I'm going to read the big goal uh, just to kind of ground this in the work. 
Uh, so by 2021, CSD is vertically and horizontally aligned system of curriculum and instruction will identify and engage each student's gifts and passions and build core competencies through real, real world hands-on learning experiences. In this pathway, we have three key objectives. The first one deals with the, that first part of the big goal, and that is development of the, of the horizontally, vertically, and standards aligned curriculum. And so there's a lot of work in, in this uh, particular objective in this uh, rather uh, complex um, pathway. The work that uh, has been done is uh, development and implementation of curricular resources for uh, English language arts and specifically K-8 writing curriculum, uh, grades seven through eight ELA curriculum. We implemented foundations in grades K through three. And then for our students with IEPs, there were three programs that we introduced uh, in the district and they are read naturally read 180 and system 44. Specifically, exactly. choices program for the high school. Is Dr. Riley frozen on everyone else's screen? Okay. Let me see if I can give him a call and let him know he's frozen. If not, let's see. He's back. I think, back. I think I'm back. All right, sorry, I'm, I'm my my two Wi-Fi's. So one of them is just not turning on right now today. So hopefully I can make it through this piece of it. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not sure where I cut out. Um, but the, the first bullet okay. point where I'm I'm sorry. You ended with the read 180 and system 44 and read naturally for IEP yeah. students. Okay, great. Uh, and so the, the next second bullet are the new resources that we introduced for the secondary schools, and they are the choices program for high school social studies. We expanded our use of Envision Math. We had Envision Math for grades K through six. We actually adjusted, they came out with a new version. So we adopted the new version just last year for grades K through five. Um, and part of the plan, we also added uh, Envision Math for the high school as well as the middle school. And the high school program we use Envision now for Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. We added Elevate Science for grades 6 through 8. Authentico is a resource uh, that's new for Spanish. Uh, we added that a couple of years ago. Um, Achieve 3000 was added for our uh, ELA Academic Achievement uh, classes. And then TTRS for the World Language classes at both the middle school and the high school. And then our last bullet point, uh, we've, we've done some significant work in both computer science and engineering as we've transitioned away from a more traditional uh, technology education or industrial arts program at the high school. And so we added uh, four, five new courses for computer science and three new courses for engineering. The second objective has to deal with uh, developing common assessments across the, the district. Uh, in addition to the common assessments, we also uh, continue to utilize uh, different benchmarks. And so we are using Lincoln benchmarks for both math and ELA in grades one and two. We've been doing that for a couple of years. We continue that this year. We made a shift in our benchmarking for this year for mathematics and ELA for grades three through the high school. And we also made that change for uh, science in grade eight as well as biology at the high school. In terms of the common assessments, we have common assessments built into our programs and for both wonders and envision. And, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't mention wonders as a, a new program um, for our elementary uh, uh, reading and uh, writing. Um, but in terms of common assessments, we have uh, created common assessments for grades five through seven, and they are administered through Linkit. We've done the same thing for ELA in grades seven and eight, and we have common assessments for biology. Other content uh, areas and courses have some common assessments developed, but not fully across the entire um, breadth of the content in, in other areas just yet, but we continue to work on those. 
Uh, in addition to that, um, I, I should have mentioned on the last screen as it relates to curriculum, we are continuing to do work in our secondary uh, curricular uh, areas uh, with uh, teachers working through the summer on uh, their particular content. And we've also, as noted in our uh, legislative meeting last week, partnered with an organization called Residence who is gonna be working on the ELA and math curriculum for grades K through six. So that work will also begin this summer. And then the last bullet point uh, for this objective is the implementation of AIMS web assessments for progress monitoring. And that's across the district between grades K through 12. And so our last objective involves the work that we've done around instructional strategies, specifically intended to engage students and maximize active learning and personalizing the curriculum. And so we had some significant work done around in, in our professional development for our teachers, where we brought in a, a key text that we uh, used to uh, ground the work. And uh, beginning with uh, George Corus's The Innovator's Mindset, uh, Empower, uh, AJ Giuliani and John Spencer. And then the last two from the, the group of, of John Hattie, Engagement by Design, and then uh, this past year, the 10 Mind Frames for Visible Learning. With our PBL initiative, we have uh, consistent and, and regular professional learning opportunities provided for our teachers in uh, project-based learning. We also added uh, some positions. Uh, we have teachers who have demonstrated uh, a greater proficiency around the idea of the use of instructional technology uh, in, in the classroom. And so we um, brought some teachers into the Department of Innovation within the Office of Education to help support the work around instructional technology which was key to our success at the time uh, that schools closed. And, and we went to a, a virtual uh, option as well as the hybrid uh, component. And now transitioning out of that, this year, our elementary and secondary instructional technology teacher leaders help support teachers in the balance between the use of instructor, instructional technology as they return to the classroom. Uh, we also provided uh, updates around instructional technology through the Department of Innovation. We uh, maintained the SMORE, uh, relaunched our blog this year and also maintain a website as a resource for our teachers. And then lastly, work continues on the homework uh, policy development, uh, which is also referenced in the objective in the, that last statement, CSD will adopt assessment, assignment, and homework practices that are aligned with best practices and support the holistic needs of students. And that last key objective is uh, the last part of Pathway 1. So I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to Ms. Collins for Pathway 2. Good evening, everyone. So Pathway 2 was student achievement. Some of the uh, key objectives that we completed um, was one implementation of our IXL um, for a K-12 intervention. So we had that for ELA in mathematics and was utilized, um, we began utilizing it last year. And in addition to that, we were able to expand it. So we use it in all our classrooms, K through 12. So all of our students at the, um, and within the district have access to IXL. In addition, we, as we did previously, we implemented um, credit recovery at the high school um, a few years ago because we noticed that we had a number of students who were credit deficient which um, enabled them to graduate on time. Um, this year, we actually had our highest number for participa participa participation and which allow a number of our seniors to graduate on time. In addition to that, allow students who are undercredited, who were sophomores to move up to their junior year. So they will now graduate on time as seniors. Um, we implemented flexible scheduling for 7 through 12, which expanded more time, instructional time for our students in front of their teachers. Um, at the middle school, they also extended their intervention period time and really focused on um, looking at where our kids really needed support in literacy and mathematics to redefine how they did win at Cedarbrook um, under Mr. Metcalf's leadership. And at the high school, it's the first time that we've had the intervention period. We did have some challenges, how we continue to grow and the team has met to talk about how we can improve things for next year. So we're looking forward to um, working with our teachers next year and, and the smoother transition of implementation of the innovation period at the high school. Here we talk about uh, multiple measures for student growth. Um, one of the key pieces was um, implementing um, the school-wide information system SWIS from K to 12. 
as you all know, a number of our elementary schools have been um, honored or recognized for their levels of achievement and participation, participation. And we continue to grow that program up to the high school as well. Um, several teams have, um, which you'll see on the next slide, have actually decided leadership teams to come together to talk about um, how they can continue to work and move forward for the upcoming school year. Also in Lincoln, we have expanded our use of Lincoln, which, which is our student, um, our data management warehouse where not only can you look at assessment, assessment data, you can look at attendance data as well. And we also continue every year to look at what else Lincoln can do for us so that we can put data and information at the fingertips of our teachers and our school administrators so they can constantly see how our kids are progressing um, throughout, whether it's um, academic achievement or behavioral or um, just in general, um, in attendance as well, making sure that our kids are coming to school, uh, what happens when they don't come to school, and what patterns do we see um, and, and trends do we see when analyzing the data that we can store and link it. For our milestone of non-academic intervention strategies, we want to go back to PBIS. Um, and we talked about, I talked about this briefly, how our core leadership teams um, have coordinated numerous activities and you've seen the promotions all throughout our buildings in regards to PBIS. And the fact um, that um, mean that we are reaching fidelity at a number of our elementary schools, which was a huge success. So we continue to grow the program and we look forward to what's going to up, what's coming in the next school year. And we've already said we have teachers already gearing up to work this summer to continue the development of the program. At, um, can you hear me? I'm sorry, my I got a weak internet. Okay. Thank you. All right. So for in terms of equity and achievement, uh, we continue to um, analyze and look at our data, our achievement data for our students for in this place and honors. Um, in addition to that, um, as you all know, the high school was um, um, identified as ATSI in terms of their growth of our students who are in special education. Um, actually, this year was supposed to be the end of the year, end of the plan. However, they will not release the actual um, scores or what we need to obtain to come out of the plan until the fall. And because of that, we had to um, write a new plan, um, which is basically the same plan over again, <laughs> to ensure that we met the uh, criteria set by the state. And we have to have that plan um, approved again in the fall. However, that plan is subject to change because if we if, it, if it, we demonstrate that we had met um, the proficiency level to move from ATSI, then that will negate that entire plan and the high school will be released from um, having to do the additional um, uh, planning and or participate in the uh, professional development opportunities provided by Montgomery County Intermediate Unit because we, our students have um, met the criteria to exit. We do know that one of the one of the exit criteria was for us to receive, um, reach 74% of attendance for our special education students. We Throughout the plan, we have exceeded that. We had said in initially anyway that we thought it was just a glitch in the recording of their, um, their attendance versus the actual attendance of the students that um, the state, the data that the state had. So we're just looking forward. And because we didn't have the um, Keystone the one year, we're waiting to find out what they will um, utilize in terms of growth for us moving forward to this, whether or not we met the target um, that the state wanted us to achieve um, to move out of ATSI. So the fall will have many answers for us. So we continue to operate on the current plan until they give us new guidelines in the fall. We have continued to increase our partnerships with the Arcadia, with Arcadia University and the University of Pennsylvania, and also with our cultural proficiency and equity student ambassadors. And this now leads to professional learning pathway three. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so for the, the first section here, uh, which is around the professional learning plan, 
Um, by 2021, the strategic plan is looking to see that we have a, a fully operational plan in place. Uh, we now do have a cyclical and systematized uh, professional development system uh, that's been implemented across the district. Um, we've used that to really work through a Danielson model uh, refresh and norming, and all of that was aligned and sort of wrapped in a package of student engagement, which Dr. Riley uh, pointed to earlier. Um, our professional learning has been centered on the research that really supports best practices, um, specifically a lot of the research coming out uh, from John Hattie. And um, as was also mentioned earlier regarding COVID-19, we had basically two years in there where our professional devel development plan had to shift to meet the needs of teachers in the remote and hybrid environments uh, during that time. The second aim of the strategic plan was around internal capacity and expertise. Uh, we've shifted from around approximately 75% of our professional development was being provided by outside consultants. And we're now, that is now at about six and a half percent led by outside consultants in 2019, 2020. And now again, because COVID sort of switch, you know, upends things to a certain degree. Uh, but if you look at the professional development that we have implemented this year, a, a very significant percentage of it has been led by Cheltenham School District staff. Um, so we are continuing that trend. Um, and um, also, and, and, and that's reiterating the second point here, um, and a lot of that's been through our current use of our asynchronous uh, system, which is through Kite Learning Platform. Uh, the third piece is all about the, the, putting in place the steps necessary in order for us to have functional professional learning communities. The first piece to that is that we had some relatively large lifts that we had to do K-12 regarding the reformulation of school schedules over the course of these last years in order to create the conditions necessary for PLCs to actually function and thrive. So a big part of the initial work was trying to get the to get the bedrock in place in order to be able to do it properly. And so with that in place, we now have PLCs operational at all school grade, all schools at all grade levels and across all subjects. Um, so that is a, that is a district wide achievement that we have met. The strategic plan also calls for significant moves around cultural competency. Um, at the time of the writing of the strategic plan, the term being used then was cultural competency. You might also hear cultural proficiency. Um, and now a lot of that work has shifted over into um, other terms like anti-racism. It's all sort of couched under the same category. Um, we initiated this with a year long intensive cultural proficiency program that was in 2017, 2018. Um, we incorporated a lot of local experts, including Dr. Howard Stevenson, uh, Dr. Barbara Moore Williams and others. And that was essentially sort of the initial kickstart for this process. And we've since then been shifting that work more and more towards the school-based teams. And a lot of it has been about trying to integrate the professional development that teachers received into the actual process and procedures of the district. So for example, the way that we have um, melded the Danielson framework with cultural proficiency practices in the classroom. So that, that's an expression of how we've tried to bring these things to the classroom and away from just sort of stand and deliver type PD. And that brings us to holistic experiences. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna discuss with you some of the initiatives that we've put in place um, as it pertains to our holistic experiences for pathway four of the strategic plan. So one of the first objectives was to have universal norms and expectations. And as Ms. Collins already previously touched on, we did this through the implementation of our positive behavioral interventions and supports. 
Um, each of our school buildings has a team that meets monthly um, and they go over different initiatives, different programs, different activities that they can do with students on the tier one level um, to help promote a universal um, norm and expectation for their particular buildings that also aligns across our buildings. Um, as stated previously, all of our K through eight buildings did reach fidelity at tier one for PBIS this particular school year. Um, our PBIS teams were also recognized um, through the IU and were able to present at the Equity is MTSS conference during the school year um, due to the great work that they did during the pandemic to keep our families and our students engaged in our PBIS systems. Um, they had different activities that were virtual and also in-person, you know, awards that they went to people's homes and provided to some of our high school students. So um, our, our teams really excelled during that time um, in this PBIS work. And um, also mentioned on the previous slide, Cedarbrook and Wincote have received advanced tier training. Um, Cedarbrook this past school year has been utilizing some tier two strategies such as check in and check out. And they also utilized a universal screener. In regards to health and wellness, I would say that the pandemic um, really allowed us to take a step back and to analyze how we address overall health, how we clean our buildings, um, how we keep our children safe. So I think over the past definitely two years, there's been a large push on how we keep our students and our staff healthy. Um, you know, ordering masks, sanitizer, um, cleaning supplies has definitely um, been on the forefront of um, our efforts um, to continue to keep our children health, healthy and safe. In regards to um, mental health, uh, during the implementation of this past strategic plan, um, we hired an additional social worker. So we have one at the elementary and the high school level. We've continued our partnership with um, Aldersgate and we have SAP counselors in our buildings. This particular school year, we increased the level of support that we're able to provide with our SAP counselors by implementing it in two of our elementary school buildings, as well as our um, high school and middle school. And a goal that we have for next year is to have SAP in all of our K through eight buildings to provide that additional counseling support. We continued with our wellness committee meetings um, in the years during the strategic plan. And within that, we broadened the scope of the wellness committee to also address um, overall emotional health for our students. Um, in the meeting that we had this particular school year, um, we were also focusing not only on physical health, but also mental health. Um, and we have our partnership with Effective School Solutions, where we um, were able to provide intentional professional development, as well as clinical support for Elkins Park School. And then for the last objective with social and emotional learning, um, this particular school year, we have implemented second step SEL curriculum curriculum, which is implemented in our K through eight buildings. Um, our counselors and our teachers are utilizing it. We're hoping to expand that scope for next year to include some additional teachers in our buildings and provide them with the training necessary to um, effectively use the curriculum within their classroom settings. Um, as stated before, we're also going to increase our partnership with Aldersgate. Not only will we have SAP counselors in the buildings, but we're also going to be utilizing one of their SEL curriculums called Too Good, which helps our elementary students make um, healthy living choices. Um, we have a clinician from Child and Family Focus in all of our K through four buildings who are offering clinical support for students that have medical assistance. Um, for those students that don't have medical assistance, we partnered with Aldersgate to provide telehealth services, six free sessions for families who are currently on waiting lists for outside services. Um, and the district is um, assisting in the cost of that particular service. And again, our partnership with Effective School Solutions, which provided a clinician, professional development, teacher training, and a MTSS playbook. And next we have our Pathway 5, Communications and Engagement. And I am going to jump in for Mr. Kaufman in his absence. I'm going to try to do um, his pathway some justice that he, that he has led for the bulk of this um, plan. 
And so um, I think we can all agree that um, the community communications and engagement outreach um, pathway um, that required a, a variety of stakeholders to be engaged um, was completed during Mr. Um, Kaufman's um, leadership as our director of communications. We have a much broadening um, social media presence. We have an increase in social media interactions. And just as someone who visits the schools and visits our buildings, um, you always see either Mr. Kaufman or someone um, representing him from his office or one of our um, school-based social media leaders taking pictures and uploading things to keep all of us informed and engaged in what's happening within the district. The next area is partnerships. Um, while the Arcadia University partnership isn't new, it has greatly expanded over the last five years um, in terms of not only uh, utilizing our Arcadia University partnership for student teachers, but also to help push forward our STEM initiatives, to also um, for dual enrollment for our high school students, also shared use of facilities. Um, I can go on and on. We, we have really um, broadened that particular relationship. We also have a relationship with Thomas Jefferson University's East Falls um, around our PBL and our STEM offerings um, as well. In terms of alumni engagement, this is one of the areas that we really highly recommend that is carried over into the upcoming strategic plan. We do believe that, um, that Mr. Kaufman has done a great job in getting this started, but there is more to do and we want more and increased and deepened engagement with our alumni. So this is something that we're asking um, that absolutely makes it into the next plan because we do believe that that is, is critical for the institutional knowledge, the institutional memory, and for um, you know, moving, past, moving our past forward to really make sure that we engage um, those who have walked the halls of our Sheltonham schools to help in the regard of, of progress within the district. Um, branding, the This is Sheltonham branding, um, we know kind of took off on Twitter a couple years ago and, and that hashtag is still being used. When you see it, you know that's a part of our brand. Again, we have increased our social media and our traditional uh, presence, people know um, who we are. They know our different offerings. Um, it, there's nothing for me to go to a conference um, locally and also nationally and, and, and hear people reference some of the things that they've seen about our district, um, positive stories, positive things that our students are doing um, online. If you see our um, Instagram page lately, um, We've been adding a lot of things to that. We have our seniors every year being highlighted, um, which has allowed people to connect to um, one another. I know for me, I had a personal connection. My daughter happened to be at graduation and she's connected with one of the students at our high school who's going to college with her next year. And, and it all landed from social media. So it's, it's definitely an outreach. I saw it in my, in my home. She said, oh, you have to introduce me to um, you know, such and such student, we're going to the same school in the fall. So that lets me know when the teenagers are talking, it is, it's going beyond the, the academics and going beyond those of us who work in Sheltonham, it is extending out into the public. And so um, Mr. Kaufman and, and, and um, Ricky, Nick, Ricky have done an excellent job of making sure that again, all of our social media, our websites, everything is updated um, and, and updated in, in a way that engages people. There's, there's video, there's their pictures, there's um, text where it's needed. So I think we've done a really good job with, um, with our branding. And last but not least, we're gonna enter into a few closing thoughts before we go and get into questions. And so um, we, we've had those five pathways, they served us well. And now under Dr. Scriven's leadership, we are moving into a new plan um, that will uh, bring us um, even closer to our goal of making sure that all of our students have um, every opportunity to have an excellent um, education in the Sheltonham School District. And so in terms of recommendations, our first recommendation is we do believe, um, and when I say we, I'm speaking for the Office of Education and those involved um, in tonight's presentation. We do believe that, that the next plan should be a fresh plan. Um, while we may have some suggestions of carryover, 
We do believe that it should start from scratch um, under a new leadership, under the leadership of a new board president and under the leadership of some new board members as well to really give a fresh set of eyes, a fresh look at the plan. Um, you know, just, just, you know, looking forward and making sure that our next steps um, really reflect where we are today as a district and not, not where we were when we started this plan, because I think um, our office agrees that we have made some significant improvements and some significant strides um, underneath the last plan. And now it's kind of time to pass the proverbial baton to get started on a new plan. We also believe that there should be a comprehensive needs analysis um, before the start of the plan. And I believe based on the information I have that that is starting to take place. We wanna make sure that anything that goes into the next plan or any thoughts about the next plan um, comes from data, comes from um, what we know to be true here and comes from a, a place of need or a place of growth as opposed to um, you know anything that looks good, like, oh, that's a great idea, let's do that. We, we really want this plan to reflect the Sheltonham School District. Um, we also recommend that the, the plan, the length of the plan be decreased um, because we wanna make sure that, that with a, a shorter length of a plan gives us more time to, to pivot and to course correct if needed. And, and we don't wanna feel like we're, we're tied down to um, you know, what we've come up with today. And I think we can all agree, especially after the pandemic, a lot can happen in five years. Um, so we do recommend that a shortened plan um, be considered we also um, recommend that, that there are realistic goals and objectives aligned to the designated time frame. We, we want to do things great. We don't want to rush greatness. So we want to make sure that if we say we're going to do something that we don't um, overpromise and underdeliver. For this plan, we also think we should increase student involvement because at the end of the road, it is about the students. It is about their progress. Um, so we would like to have more student voice student involvement um, as much as possible um, so that they can speak confidently to the plan and they can speak confident, confidently about what's working, what's not working in the district. We would also ask, um, unlike the former plan, that there is some uh, fiscal accountability um, tied into the plan. What are the dollars? How much do we have to dedicate to the plan? We wanna make sure that anything we say we're going to do has a budget line item that is um, attached to that. We also recommend that we confirm inter-rater reliability and goal setting. And what that means is we wanna make sure that when we set these goals, they aren't just Tamara Smith's goals, but their goals of board members, their goals of other teachers, there's goals of other administrators who agree that yes, this is something we should move forward um, with. And not just because you know we're the Office of Education, we're the experts in student achievement and curriculum and instruction, but we also need to hear from some other voices that this is indeed the direction we want to go in. We wanna make sure that there is triangulation of data and measurements, that we're not just looking at standardized test scores. We're not just looking at summative data. We're not just looking at numbers and quantitative data. We're also looking at qualitative data because that matters um, as well. We wanna make sure that this plan allows for scheduled moments to adjust the plan as needed. So even if we do have a shorter plan, we wanna make sure that there are some checkpoints or some flexibility um, as the plan goes on to say, you know what, we need to course correct. We need to make a change. We need to make a modification that's still true to the overall goals and objectives of the plan, but does allow for some flexibility so that we don't continue to do something just because it's in the plan, but to give us an opportunity to really do what's best for our children and our families. And last but not least, we recommend that the next plan, it really is demonstrative of value being, um, the, the value of quality is um, more than the value of quantity. So we wanna make sure that this plan really does a few things really, really well and gets us to do some things really, really well and some really good outcomes as opposed to um, a, a massive document that asks us to do multiple things pretty average. We, we wanna do some really good work really well. Um, excellence is, is coming to mind. Um, outstanding is coming to mind. Um, we wanna make sure that, that we don't forsake quality when trying to do multiple things um, 
within the next plan. And so with that, those are our recommendations. We're closing out um, our formal strategic plan. Um, thank you to everyone who uh, by uh, an action step or by a recommendation who helped um, us to, to move along this plan the last five years. And at this time, we are going to open up um, for questions. And so everyone who presented tonight is listed as a panelist. So we'll all be able to um, have an opportunity to engage in questions um, as they relate to our different um, topics or areas of uh, expertise. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Smith, and thank you for the um, the other presenters, Dr. Riley, Ms. Collins, Ms. Keene, and Mr. Pimentel. Um, I hope I didn't forget anybody. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to board questions. If you have a question, just please raise your hand and I'll call on you. I see your hand is up. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, appreciate the um, team approach to the presentation tonight um, and the information that was provided. Uh, I, for those, I, I'm not sure if the presentation that's posted online, I think it has the appendix, but there's a data point, I think it's like slide 32. Um, could someone add some context to the 2021-22 benchmark assessment? growth and mathematics, growth and literacy. Could just someone add some context to what that data is? Sure, I can, I can add some context uh, to the data. So this is a measurement of uh, growth from our first benchmark, which happens in the fall, to our last benchmark that takes place in the spring. Uh, as I noted earlier, the benchmarks are different uh, depending on which grade level. So grades one and two use a Lincoln benchmark and grades three through the high school use the uh, CDT, the classroom diagnostic tool uh, that the state provides. And so this is a, uh, the, the growth percentage is growth in the scaled score uh, of our, the average scaled score of our students over the course of the school year. Uh, thank you. And so essentially we're in grade one, that's saying 22% of first graders experience growth, or is that actually measuring some type of growth on that PVAS? No, so I'm sorry. It's so of those 286 students, they, they collectively yeah. demonstrated an average percentage growth of 22.7 points, essentially. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Appreciate that. Uh, just moving forward, it, um, there was uh, mention, I, I believe it was Mr. Pimentel um, talked about the convergence of the Danielson model with some of the cultural competence work. Um, so just in, in a bit of curiosity, is that, if you could add, add a little context there, because my mind went to, is that somehow the goals speak to cultural competence, I don't want to answer my own question, but could you just add a sentence or two about how those two are converging, the Danielson and then the cultural competence um, work? Sure, so an, an example would be, um, <clears throat> to the, like for example, the one we've worked on a lot, um, which is Danielson 3C, which is um, student cognitive engagement. So that is a sort of standard educational domain of professional development that any district might work on. So that sort of stands alone. And then in addition to that, with our work around cultural proficiency, we, came, we identified a series of actions that teachers can take in the classroom that are both culturally proficient, but also support the work around student cognitive engagement. And so then we created an aligned document that sort of layers on the standard Danielson 3C information, also with a 3C aligned set of cultural, culturally proficient instructional practices. So it's basically like just another layer of Danielson. Um, and that's something that we've developed here in Cheltenham. I uh, appreciate that. Um... 
and even that's it's exciting to hear. It's not like a new framework <laughs> to think about cultural proficiency, but you're also using this the same framework just applied um, in in a in a in a in a different way. So that that's in terms of like behavior change, change management. That's that's um, certainly appreciate hearing that approach. Um, and then, so and, uh, the rec I wanted to also add, just as one board member, the res recommendations that you all offered certainly resonate um, pretty deeply with, with me. And quite frankly, in terms of a plan that speaks to the most important thing, the most important factors, like no matter the programs, no matter the strategies, like what are the most important things that need to be addressed? Uh, and then, right, is there, is there the, um, the moments and time to know what are the important data to look at? What are the questions to ask about that data? Uh, and, and that can really be iterative. And so um, I really appreciate, really appreciate the recommendations that were offered tonight, um, especially also around student involvement and how we can share power in real ways and decision making and also uh, also planning um, with students and as, as they are uh, the, one of our primary stakeholders. Um, so thanks for the context. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Haywood. Well, yeah, I have to ask you if no one else has their hand up. I don't see it right now. Um, again, I wanted to thank everybody for their presentations. It was really helpful to go through each of the pathways, um, you know, individually. The one, and I really appreciate the appendices, I think it did provide context for. Um, some of the uh, steps that we've taken and, and the goals that we've reached. One I had with respect to the new STEM course enrollment status, and I don't know if that was like slide 33. Um, I'm not sure it was item P1. Slide, slide 30. Slide 30, okay, thank you, Dan. Mr. Cohen. Yes. So it was great to see the increase in enrollment in some of the courses like AP Computer Science Principles, Introduction to Programming, Robotics, um, and Cybersecurity. And I'm just curious in terms of expected enrollment for 22-23. Um, I guess it's a little too early for the students to have selected their courses for next year, but do we anticipate similar numbers or higher numbers for these courses? Yes, those courses continue to grow and expand. Sarah Potomac has done a phenomenal job um, with the advancement of those courses at the high school. And so with that um, expected kind of increased enrollment, I, is Ms. Putterman the only teacher that's teaching these classes or are there others? Ms. Putterman, um, Mr. Sheena as well, um, and there's a couple other uh, math teachers who are looking to obtain the certification so they can help support in this area. Okay, great. Because I was just was curious in terms of the increased enrollment um, that we had an adequate number of teachers to be able to offer those courses. Okay. And for design and prototyping, did we have a sense of why there were no students enrolled this particular school year for that course? That course did not run this year. Okay answer that question. Um, and then in terms of the NXL and CSD, can you help me understand that, um, that slide? I wasn't sure how to read the dashboard, what I was really looking at. Sure, and uh, so this slide is is just a glimpse of uh, how we utilize IXL or how how frequently IXL is used is, is probably a better way to, to say that. Uh, this is a comparison of how we used IXL last year where we had uh, part of our school year um, where students were either virtual or hybrid. And so we rely a lot on uh, the use of IXL uh, from an instructional technology standpoint where it is something that students can access uh, at any time from anywhere. And so the, uh, the slide on the, the, I'm sorry, the image on the right is uh, how we're utilizing or how we utilized IXL this year and the frequency with which we used it. And even though our students have, have uh, returned to schools, um, our teachers have found a way to continue a high level of use of IXL. And so this particular uh, set of uh, images 
simply shows that it, it's showing the amount of um, usage that we're getting out of IXL. And so demonstrating that students are engaging with the, uh, the platform, whether they're in school or out of school, there are, there are several reports that we can run with IXL that can give us a little bit more granular data that indicates whether students are uh, engaging with the learning through IXL, whether in, in school versus out of school, uh, it actually breaks it down by day as well so we can see how much they're doing either at night during the week or if they're engaging with this on the weekend. Uh, and so to see an increase in the number of questions uh, that were uh, answered this year in a year where we, we didn't necessarily need to rely on IXL as much, uh, but we still saw an increase is more a demonstration of uh, students engaging in, in the learning uh, process beyond the school hours. Thank you, that, that provided a lot of context to this particular slide. And my last question is for Mr. Pimentel. I know that you had indicated that the professional learning in part was structured so that there was a higher engagement of students. Um, and just was curious in terms of how we measured student engagement, was that done through student surveys or any other means to really see if there was a translation of the professional development to student engagement? So the baseline data that you're looking for, um, you know, I did not put that in this appendix that was found in the professional development presentation that I gave to the Ed Affairs Committee about maybe 10 months ago or so. Um, so that data is came out of the curriculum audit. And so it's primarily based on classroom observation of instruction, um, as opposed to student survey data, so to speak. Um, and so a part of our, some of the adjustments, um, it, did not, it actually did not directly come up in this presentation today, but another major shift that has happened um, out of the Office of Education has been a significant increase in the amount of classroom observations on the part of building principals and assistant principals. And so it's through that qualitative data that we can see an increase in, in student cognitive engagement. Um, now, once again, I mean, I, I, I don't blame anyone for being tired of hearing this, but the impacts um, of, of the, the COVID-19 school closing and you know what it means to be exclusively remote in a, an exclusively remote learning environment and hybrid environments etc um you know i mean that just throws things for for a spin that nobody could have seen coming um so it's a little bit harder to be able to have this nice linear path of classroom observations starting from 2016 and being able to chart it out from year to year to year and you can see like you know a very clear pathway from where we started to where we are. Um, it, it's more like looking at where a bomb went off and trying to figure out where everything is. Um, but but th that's a long way of, of answering a question, which is to say it's based on classroom observation of instruction. Okay, thank you. And I um, plus one Mr. Epps' comments um, regarding the uh, development of the next strategic plan. I'm really looking forward to that. I think we do have probably critical lessons learned in the midst of a pandemic, which we hope is not repeated uh, during the next five years. But I think it also provides hopefully some ideas of things that we may want to continue um, that we thought were best practices that we put in place from, you know, during the pandemic as well. So um, I don't have any other questions. Any other board questions? Okay, and we don't have any other, okay. I re-raised this was a, Mr. App, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, something Mr. Pimatol um, mentioned in terms of the impact of uh, the pandemic and remote um, schooling, I was gonna say remote work, but remote schooling. Um, I was looking at the, the numbers around AP and honors enrollment, and I know there's, there's, there's efforts underway and ongoing around um, representation, uh, but I did see really uh, almost across the board, um, you know, it was like six as a total, like 60 strong, 60 percent, 65 percent, 65 percent as a total population and about 46 percent this past year that that was enrolled in at least one class. And so my assumptions went to the pandemic. Is there 
to the qualitative data. Is there part of the story that can be shared there? Actually, it's not even a data piece. It's actually a, we, what we realized, and we're still working on there's a glitch. So the data pool was only for this semester. Um, we will update that with the sec because they're no longer enrolled. So we have to go back and because they finished semester one and pulled the additional data. Not all the AP data is accurate. It's the honors data that is um, missing from the first semester. And once we realized that we had to go back and we pull, we had to redo the actual report, the how the report is constructed because we changed over the schedule in the high school. And now we have to go back and redo all those reports that we used to do they're not as easy to do anymore. So we will update that. And once I, once we, I took another look at the numbers, I was like, that's extremely low. And then I realized it's because it's only pulling the kids that ended the school year in June and not the kids who finished in January. So we will correct that, that will be updated. Ms. Reps, does that answer your question? It does. I, okay. I have a leaky bucket, so I'm just gonna mute myself. Thank you, I'm not gonna say anything else. <laughs> No, that's okay. Um, Ms. Collins, kind of piggybacking on that, that question, do we know kind of, and you probably have this information, you may not have it readily available tonight, the breakdown between AP and honors enrollment. So I know once you update this information, um, just as one board member, that might be helpful to kind of see the difference between honors and AP enrollment, although, you know, all good to see. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other board question, uh, board questions or comments? I just want to say that Mr. Epps put in the chat some really great information about his children using the IXL platform. I think that they make up most of the statistics that we looked at tonight, Mr. Epps, <laughs> which is great. Okay, Ms. Mulhern. Well, just in the IXL vein, um, I think that this ties into going back to the um, at least a at Cedar Brook, and I'm sure the high school as well, changing the schedule to have those intervention periods, that's where some of that IXL is happening, at least as I understand it from my seventh grader. And while at times it may seem, you know, a little, uh, you know, I had my IXL math with, you know, Mr. So-and-so today, but it really is that, you know, that kind of forced, I hate to say that, but that practice where you're, that time is dedicated. It's not something that you have to complete at home later on or squeeze it in, you know, while you're getting your math instruction, that reinforcement or an area that they might need, you know, more practice in is happening built into the schedule. So I know that uh, we have certainly appreciated. And as I put in the chat, uh, I can't tell you the number of times my fifth grader references something. And then we're like, when did you learn that? She's like, oh, I think it was an IXL thing I read. So, you know, it is, it's sinking in there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mulhern, for those, um, sharing those comments. Um, any other board questions or comments? I don't see any. I just want to thank everyone for presenting this evening. Um, again, looking forward to the development of the new strategic plan, but really appreciate the wrap up of this plan and with the recommendations that were provided. Um, if the board members could hold on the line for just a few minutes, um, I'd appreciate that. We just have a very quick update we wanted to provide to the board. Ms. Um, I wanted, yes. Oh, I was going to remind you about the minutes. If in case you had forgotten. Thank you very much, Ms. Mulhern. I did forget. So um, now that we have a quorum, we'll go back to approve the May um, minutes, um, Educational Affairs Committee minutes from May 18th. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved, Pam Henry. Thank you, is there a second? Second, Leah Mulhern. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed? Okay. That motion carries. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. <laughs> okay, I'll go with Mr. Epps as a first and Ms. Henry as a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, everyone have a great evening. <laughs>